the glassy sea, by then with washings over, we're redeemed. What do we do then? We stand on it. Pun, isn't it? Not bizarre. It's a pun. I think designed by the Holy Spirit. That word which we wash in now, we stand on then. Interesting, isn't it? Which leads me to one other uh, verse that you should have in your repertoire, and that's the Christian's bar of soap. If you need washing, where do you find the Christian's bar of soap? How do you scrub up? There's a specific verse that will solve your problem for you. It's 1 John 1 9 is the Christian's bar of soap. 1 John 1 9, the Christian's bar of soap. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as you study this and you become frightened, good heavens, I've done that. Have I lost my salvation? Scurry quickly to 1 John 1, 9 and scrub up. <laughs> confess your sins and He is faithful. It's His faithfulness that's your refuge, not yours. Your faith is a gift from Him. If you're faithful, don't get smug, because Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 tells you it was a gift. Nothing you did. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, it's because the Holy Spirit gave it to you. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that, that is the faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift. Why? So that no flesh can boast. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, part A, part B, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, I'm grateful for that cleansing, because He's complete, He does it right. Now, we have, you know, sort of rambled here, um, and those of you that know my capacity for library research are relieved because I could have waltz out all kinds of other obscure things that would probably have no practical benefit for you when we're talking about we're talking about Israel in the wilderness boy that can go on for a semester you know so it felt it seemed appropriate in verse 5 to in fact explore the lessons of Israel but I want to before we, we're going to go on next time to spook show time verse 6 but before we do, I don't want to leave the history of Israel, since this is the burden of this letter, is apostasy. I want to share with you something that's going on in the body of Christ. And so it's sort of a parenthesis, but it's appropriate at this time, both because of the verse 5, but also because of the whole tenor of this letter. And we'll talk more about it. We won't, we won't exhaust the subject tonight. But let me describe some things to you. The early church, somewhere along the way, and I'm not, I didn't do enough historical research to know exactly when the errors started to creep in. I think it was Augustine, somewhere along the way. The Christian church got it into its head that the Jews crucified their Messiah. There was a notion emerging that the promises that were made to Israel were forfeited because she rejected and crucified her Messiah. And those promises devolved upon the church. And the spiritual Israel idea, and there are aspects of that that are valid, don't misunderstand me, but that theme predominated from roughly the days of Augustine onwards throughout the denominational Christian church and became the excuse for anti-Semitism, it became the theme by which the Crusaders could have contests, contests to see how many Jewish babies they could get on a sword. It became the, the trauma that today still represents a cultural gap between people of Jewish background and so-called Christians. Bear in mind, in their mind, a Gentile is equivalent to a Christian. Hitler was a Christian. The writings of Nietzsche and others laid the philosophical groundwork on top of that for what ultimately became the Holocaust. Okay? The philosophical roots for the, the abuse of mankind, which we call the Holocaust, specifically aimed at Israel or Judaism, had its roots in the Christian church of some centuries prior. So if you, are you with me so far? You and I in this body... In fact, my wife and I were saying some of the songs we sang tonight, we sang for the first time here at Calvary Chapel 18 years ago. 
that was before the tent, that was up the street, you know, all of that. You and I have the benefit of a rediscovery of the, scripture, the Scripture's posture on Israel. We recognize that the promises that God made to Israel, some of them, the important ones, were unconditional. Her promise to the land was unconditional. The promise that the angel Gabriel gave to Mary, that we'll celebrate shortly at Christmas, was that her child was to sit on David's throne. That's not God, the Father's throne. That's not a lot of other things. It's a political throne that did not exist at the time Mary was, you know, that, that, there was not a throne of David at that time. Herod was not Jewish. He was Idumean. Herod did not sit on David's throne. So there's some issues here. Unconditional promise that need to be fulfilled. I don't want to badger all of these because most of you in this room are aware of those. And if not, you're in for the, one of the most exciting discoveries around. Um, Israel, we, you and I, as students of the Bible, know that Israel is God's time clock. You can tell what time it is in history by what's going on in Israel. Are they in favor? Are they dispersed? Are they being regathered, etc.? The promise to Isaiah, to Isaiah in chapter 11 was, When I regather my people the second time, they'll never again be uprooted. First regathering was after Babylon. The second regathering started on May 14th of 1948. Celebrating its 40th year next summer. Kind of interesting time. Jesus, the week he was crucified, wept over Jerusalem and predicted that it would be trampled down by the Gentiles. Until... The times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That's in several places, but mostly com most commonly quoted out of Luke 21, verse 24. Now, why am I going through all this? Because most of you that have been with us for some time know this is just, you know, this is, you know, Israel and prophecy 1A, basics. Let me tell you what's going on in the body of Christ. There are some doctrines emerging, and these doctrines have some strange aspects. I'm not one of these guys that gets hung up with this doctrinal shift or that. I've seen too many come and go, so I'm just not on that kick anymore. I mean, that's just not where I'm oriented. So I usually don't get concerned. This one that's emerging scares me to death for several reasons. First of all, who I'm speaking to goes by several names. You'll hear people talk about kingdom now theology. You'll hear people talk about dominion theology. This theology that's widely growing, much to my amazement, is permeating the body like AIDS. And it has some similarities, strangely enough. It was just a, a figure of speech, but it has some strange... It's not only widely growing, it's closet. Many of the major leaders in the evangelical movement, in the biblically fundamental movement, and in the charismatic movement, espouse kingdom theology and will not admit it to their congregations. It surfaces. You have to watch for it. And the privacy of their own councils, they discuss it. And kingdom theology, the reason it has those names, it's a view that the church, these leaders are returning to, that it's time that the Christian church got politically active. That it's the mission of the church to take over and straighten out the sick world. Now much of what they espouse sounds good at first until you listen very carefully. It's a re- of the old, old theology that derailed the Christian church for centuries. The notion that it's the church's destiny to rule on this planet Earth. That we rule when the Lord returns. Now why am I getting into this here? For several reasons. It's very widespread. It shocks me to discover how widespread it is. And it goes by many names. Elements of that theology have many different dimensions. The emergence of the church as the active political the, the linking of the church's mission with active political ambition is part of the thing that should throw up a caution flag, because that isn't how I read the New Testament. But let me give you just the root yardstick, and that's what kingdom theology says about Israel. And this is why it's closeted. The kingdom theology proponents argue that Israel's an imposter, she has no right to the land, and what kingdom theology and the dominion theology is laying is the roots for an anti-Semitic movement within the Christian church. And I find that frightening, 